that will increase instructional time. The third is design an elementary world language program that returns spoken language to grades K through five and is a model program for the county, state, and nation. And um, in terms of work being done, uh, Dr. Heineman and Ms. Stotler, the world language supervisor, are um, going to be visiting Princeton and Hillsborough school districts this spring. Princeton has a dual language elementary school, and Hillsborough off offers both Spanish and Mandarin in elementary school. And the fourth one is design a STEM program for grades 6 through 12 that gives students diverse 21st century course offerings and serves as a model program in the county, state, and nation. The STEM committee um, met on March 19th, according to this, and um, a board presentation on STEM is scheduled in May. So the next item is um, we got a pretty detailed update on park testing and um, keep in mind this was on March 13th so during that time William Annan and the four elementary schools were still doing testing. So um, Matt Hall is our science and technology supervisor he's also the district testing coordinator so he did the report and he said that at that time so far testing was a success. The staff training was successful. There were very few technology-related problems. And that um, the schools that were having a lot of technology-related problems were generally using Windows or Mac PCs and that the um, Chromebooks work a lot better for the park tests and that's what we're using. At that time, there were a substantial number of refusals, mainly at William Adams. And um, a complete list is being compiled. Um, Mr. Hall said that he estimates that each particular park test has seven to ten different versions. In some versions, the test questions are rearranged. Other versions contain different sets of questions. Tests include um, some questions that are field test questions. And Mr. Hall said he also heard that um, NEEP, which is National Assessment of Education Progress, questions are included in the test. And the, and the um, that, that test is a national assessment been administered uniformly throughout the U.S. The level of difficulty for the park test cannot be assessed until the results are available and the passing cut scores have um, not yet been determined. Administering the park test has proven to be very labor intensive for the administrators, teachers, and technology staff. The IT department developed its own protocols and has been doing an excellent job. Mr. Hall has been working hard to make sure that the test administrators Proctors and hall monitors are following testing protocols at all times and that students are adequately supervised. Our district has, to date, and certainly at the date of the report, our district has not had any security issues such as noise or unauthorized devices in classrooms. Two areas of concern are special education students and English language learners. Some special education students need paper versions of the test but it, but it has been difficult to get enough paper tests from the New Jersey Department of Education. Many special education students are entitled to extra time on the test, but at William Annan, it appears that the students um, have not been using the extra time. At this, um, Mr. Hall said he didn't know why at that time, and he's planning to collect data in conjunction with special education. Many accommodation tools are available, but it's um, not clear whether they help or not. Managing all the accommodation tools at William Annan turned out to be the most significant challenge for managing the test workflow due to several factors. One was the large number of students in sections, logistical issues with multiple high school level mathematics assessments, that is Algebra 1 and Geometry, being given at William Annan in addition to the middle school math test. And because due to security, only three people um, have full access to the testing interface. Uh, Mr. Hall, um, Mrs. Hudock, the principal, and Chris Brown, the IT director. Some English language learners in grades three through eight are exempt from the Park English language arts test. However, at the high school level, all English language learners have to take the English language arts test, regardless of whether they can speak or read English. These students often have to be in a one-on-one -on -one situation with a test administrator. And this um, <coughs> policy that they all have to take the test is from the Jersey Department of Education. OK, 
Okay, so the next um, the next topic that we talked about was in the current gifted and talented um, program, the male-female ratio. Dr. Heineman distributed a handout that shows the number of boys and girls in grades three through five who are currently enrolled in the 2014-15 gifted and talented mathematics program at each of the <coughs> elementary schools. And I have included a detailed attachment with the minutes. The identifying criteria for this group of students were the MAP score in mathematics and the diagnostic mathematics assessment given at the beginning of the school year. So the for this school year, the total GMT enrollment is 83 boys and 33 girls. For next year, the 2015-16 school year, the identification process has been changed. A rubric format with multiple measures will be used, consisting of an ability test, which is um, COGAD, an achievement test, which is the math mathematics test, and teacher input scale, um, the Renzulli scales, which are research-based. The male-female ratio will be recalculated in June after the current second graders have been tested and identified. In the future, additional identification measures will need to be developed as an alternative entry into the gifted and talented program to ensure that all students are correctly identified. An administrative and staff recommendation process for identifying students is also under discussion. It was noted that um, the male-female ratio in honors and AP math courses is more gender balanced. For example, eighth grade, math, eighth grade geometry currently has 42 boys and 27 girls. AP Calculus 1 has 46 boys and 53 girls. And AP Calculus 2 has 22 boys and 24 girls. Additional non-mathematics options for gifted and talented are under consideration and depend on scheduling and staff. The next topic we talked about was um, the grade distribution in English language arts in grades six through eight in the first marking periods. And this was a question that had come up that Mr. Muncher had looked into. The English, the English language arts courses in grades six and eight were revised in summer 2014. The eighth grade courses had more substantial revisions than the sixth grade courses. The new course titles are English six, language arts, Language Arts 6, which was formerly Reading, English 8, and Language Arts 8, which was formerly Communication Arts. In the past, the Communication Arts grades were typically higher than the English grades, and one of the goals of the revision was to reduce the difference in difficulty between the two courses. So Mr. Hunter compared the grade distribution in grades 6 and 8 Language Arts courses in marking periods 1 and 2 for this current school year and the last school year, 2013-14. He noted that more cold reads were done in Language Arts 8 than in English 8. To qualify for Honors English in ninth grade, students must earn an A- minus or better in both English 8 and Language Arts 8. Counselors use the grades for marking periods 1 and 2 to determine honors placement. And based on this, the course revisions appear to allow more students to enroll in Honors English 9 for 2015-16. The results for sixth grade, um, the English language arts courses differed in marking periods one and two. So generally in marking period one, um, the average grades <coughs> increased compared to last year. In marking period two, the average grade in English six also increased this year compared to last year. But in language arts six, it decreased this year compared to last year. So there was a decrease in the percentage of students earning an A. That went from 41% in last year down to 26% this year. And 80% earned an A or B. And the percentage of students earning a C increased from 7% in 2013-14 to 18% this year. And many students earned low grades on one particular cold read assignment. All of the questions on that assignment were skills-based and related to standards. The sixth grade teachers retaught the problem questions to diagnose the reading problems that the students had, which were mainly problems with context clues. Then um, the next one was about assessments, K-5 assessments in elementary math. And um, Kristen Wolf, the math supervisor, handed out some sample chapter tests from seventh grade go math, second grade go math. And she said that in grades K through two, 
Tests consist of a combination of computation problems and word problems. <coughs> but starting in grade three, grades three through five, the tests consist of word problems only. And um, at a recent elementary math problem presentation, some parents said that their children um, in grades three through five have difficulty with the tests because they do contain only the last item that we talked about was the report card review process, and Dr. Heinemann has formed a committee consisting of building and district administrators to start reviewing report cards to determine if changes are needed. needed. <coughs> More people are going to be added to the committee as the review process proceeds. Um, our next meeting is April 23rd, which is a change in date at 1.30 p.m., which is also a change in time due to some schedule conflicts. So does anybody have a question? And I, um, I think I've already um, shared this with you, but um, I wanted to share it with everyone as well. I, I have real concerns about the gifted and talented numbers um, that you were talking about with um, boys versus girls. And um, I understand that we're going to um, improve things for the current second grade, I guess you yeah. said, which is um, you know add different um, methods to test in. But I'm concerned about the kids that have already been identified. We can't, I don't want to see that the third, fourth, and fifth grade who aren't even identified in those very disparate numbers continue on that way. I'd like to see if we could add in people. Um, I know that wasn't the initial plan to add in students um, as we go on, but I think it would be really unfair to keep it this way all the way through to seventh grade algebra um, with such disparate numbers. And I, I think we want to be encouraging girls in math and science. So. Um, and not to say that I don't want to make sure that we have people who are qualified, but clearly there's something wrong, I think, with our the choices that we've made, that we have identified so few girls, given um, we look at the girls at the higher level math. So um, I certainly don't want to lose some of those people in, the, in this grade, you know, in this level. Um, so I just wanted to voice that concern again. Um, I, was, I was going to say the same thing. <laughs> I, I know we had a very rigorous process of how we identified, but I just find it hard to believe that that disparity is so defined in multiple buildings and multiple grades. Um, my degrees in early childhood education, my experience is with the primary grades more than third, fourth, and fifth. And I don't remember any standardized test scores, but I know from qualitative recollections that the disparity sh shouldn't be that great. So I don't know how we fix it, but I think we need to look into ways to readdress getting more gender equality into the program. I, I mean, unless we look at it and say, we used a really valid and this is why, but I just find it hard to believe that the disparity exists like that. Yeah, um, I know I had spoken to Dr. Heineman, who's sitting here, so maybe he wants to chime in at this point, because I know a couple board members had expressed this concern. Good evening. Um, obviously, we discussed this for quite a bit of curriculum. It was shocking to me as well when I pulled those numbers up. I think what was, um, I think even more interesting though, was what happened to those boys along the way and why don't they make it out to uh, AP Top 1. So I think it's a pretty complex problem. Uh, you know, I don't want to just simply say, uh, yes, we could find some way to incorporate more uh, girls in STEM fields in general, GTB and mathematics, and not really look at the full problem of what's happening with the program particularly at the level through grade 12, where we have a, a really tremendous difference in elementary, right, with it being a really heavy program, and then all of a sudden we get to AP Calculus at the end of the road, the girls are now the predominant, you know, uh, mix in the class. So I think it's a pretty complex problem, and I'd hate to jump into a, a very simplistic solution to a complex problem. So uh, we did use MAP um, as an assessment. I think you'd be probably hard pressed to find a more valid tool to measure mathematic, mathematic achievements since it is um, a tool that lets students push up as high as they're able to go within mathematics. I'm hopeful um, and part of the way we design the program, uh, the, the new uh, rubric, is to have um, ability-based tests right, with, with COGAP, achievement tests with MAP, and also the scales. So the only thing that's a remnant of the old program is that MAP piece, which is only 20% of the new rubric. So I'm hopeful that we'll see a better mix come June. Of course, that's a guess. Uh, it's hard to say what exactly is going to happen. Uh, we can continue talking in curriculum and see what we can do. Uh, I can certainly look at the numbers um, again, and uh, it'd, be, it'd, be, it'd be interesting to see if there's some difference between the 
diagnostic uh, by itself or math by itself. Uh, so we can try to look at those numbers and see if anything jumps out at us as being kind of obvious um, in something that we missed that was obvious. We're we'll talking about alternative solutions. I, I hate to say I really don't have any uh, easy answers to this very difficult problem. I think it's a natural problem. It's not a, uh, a Burns Township problem. This is something you see uh, kind of across the board. Okay. Since you touched on one of them already, um, the COVAX, I believe we used to use it at my event, and one of the biggest reasons I believe it was removed is it's not a changing test, so people get a hold of it, it gets into the community, and then they know what the test is to get into the program. And that's why we switched to math, because it changes. And I really don't want our district going back to COVAX again, just for that reason, because it's too easy to get the test out in the district. So do we really have to use the COVAX, or is there anything that the administration is doing to avoid that problem? Well, I mean, it's, a, it's for second grade. It's only second, second grade. So, and that's not what they were using at William no. that we no, have a problem the, with. The point is the COVAX doesn't change year to year. So as soon as parents figure it out or get a copy of it, it's, a, it's out there. Right. Well, you have to be, you know, it would be essentially um, you know, stealing a test. The only way to get it is to be an educational institution. Of course, people can do that. Well, it, it's it's something that is very commonly used. In fact, there are almost there's no other tool that is an ability-based test that is going to um, give us the results we want. Achievement tests have the capability to do that. Right, where you can have the test, you know, go up all the way through eighth grade math, even though it's elementary based. Um, but this is not a test of um, achievement mathematics. It's a test of just quantitative and nonverbal ability. And so these are, um, you know, psychometrically analyzed tools. They're, they're made by, you know, organizations that run these through many, many tests to make sure they are giving you the numbers you expect. Um, is there anything we can do to change? Unfortunately, no. They're all geared towards. It's only part of the rubric. It's yeah. not a large percentage of the rubric, so they would have to also do well. I'm just expressing parts. my concern with the COVID. Yeah, I mean, I I'd think like that, to just make sure if it's a fair test to yeah. everyone. Right. If if it's if it's compromised, like any assessment, right? That's that's not a good thing. Um, we would all like to hope that the parent population does not do such a thing, and they have um, good ethical graders. behavior. Uh, and they're second graders. Second graders. <laughs> I mean, I but 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 I do understand what you're saying. Um, yeah. The rubric, the way the rubric's set up, it would have to be a pretty unique situation where a student would um, <clears throat> score, you know, very high on, on COGAT and then very low on the other things. Um, and, you know, that that would first off, if they scored low enough, they would qualify in any case. Um, but but something should jump out if a student shockingly scored very high on a COGAT, but why would they score so low on math? That should jump out as a perhaps a chance to for the analysis of the student's ability. I just want to put my concern out. Sure. And then, can I ask some questions? I should have called you, I did. But um, why is STEM to 6 to 12? Because I know they're teaching things in elementary school. And why is it to 6 to 12? Right, well, we're starting off at 6 to 12. Are you um, stopping? Are you no, part of, it's, part of it's a matter of costs, right? So, so part of it's how much can we put off at money one time mm -hmm. and successfully accomplish. And so right now, um, the goal is to look at 612. Um, next gen science standards are changing. That that puts some constraints on us K5 because the way they're laid out, they're very specific in what you teach per grade level. Right, right now, if we say we're teaching, for instance, a standard on electricity in elementary school, uh, according to state standards, we can teach that, that you know, whatever you want. If we teach in grade two, you can. If we teach in grade four, you can. With the new standards, they're much more specific. Right? So they're going to spell out exactly where certain topics are taught. So the reality is we, we have to do a little more diligence when we're improving those standards and these STEM initiatives in elementary school. Uh, we have more flexibility. Six to implement that. Yeah, it'll absolutely be part of, right, part of the new okay, next generation. Going back to um, the concern that Elaine and Beth had raised about the gender imbalance in the GMT, I know I was thinking, you know, probably be worthwhile to just go to the, ask the teachers of the students in those grades that Aline is concerned about. I mean, we'll see what happens when we do the current second grade, but um, to make sure they don't feel that we just blatantly missed somebody. Who yeah, we, have, we can absolutely do that. So maybe, maybe that would help, maybe, maybe if there is something about that math test, 
I don't know what there is. You know, that those results weren't, sure. weren't. Well, what I can do is I can look at those two assessments again and see what the populations work out separately. And I can also work with the GT staff um, and talk with the uh, degree, which would be two, three, and four for staff to see. Because um, I might be a student that stands out. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. <coughs> well, you said you were going to add in teacher recommendations for the younger students. Yeah. So well, couldn't we look back and say there's some students, I guess that's what you're saying, but where there's some students that I would have recommended as a teacher who somehow didn't make the cut, you know that. Right, part of what we're thinking of in subsequent years, so if we're moving forward, you know, it's difficult to design that rubric. No, I feel very, I mean, I don't want to sound like I'm being too critical. I, I understand this has been an incredible undertaking. I just, you know, I think the numbers jumped out when Linda Sure, yeah, them. absolutely. And I, we, we all were a little shocked by them, you know, and it's difficult, you know, it's it's not a very subjective content area, right? You're not like you're saying, we have odd student numbers in art, and then you can say, well, maybe bias crept in, right? Something, something biased this. Um, when you look at math and you look at the, the beginning of your diagnostic test, it's a, it's a big pile of math problems. So it's difficult to see what bias that aside from what we know are, um, you, you know, some, some things that students deal with in adolescence where maybe if you are a third grade girl, it is not really the cool right. thing to do to be very good at math, and so you try to avoid it. But the good news is that, from my standpoint, is they seem to get over that by the time they get to Ridge, and they're all at AP Cal, so that's a good thing. Um, you know, I think it's, it's absolutely a problem, and it, it might not be a, an ability or achievement problem. It might be a uh, social, emotional angle that we have to take to, to remedy that. So, you know, the, the, the approach might be a little different. I think maybe all of us are initially think. Great. So, can I just say I want to comment on the same topic? Um, I'm personally a little uncomfortable with the direct connection we seem, seem to be drawing between what we know about the third, fourth, and fifth graders and seniors because a lot happens in between there. And I'm wondering, in the seventh grade, in the, in the previous program, prior to the introduction of the new GNT, did we ever look at how the seventh grade population fell out in terms of boys and girls? Because maybe You're some You're talking of it, about the mathematics. Algebra. The algebra the program. Algebra. Yeah, it, it's always been more, it's always been skewed towards. But boys to the girls. degree that the numbers you presented Well, the numbers we presented were elementary numbers. Right. Yeah. So I guess what I'm getting at is, if it's somewhat social emotional, maybe in grades three, four, and five, that emotional and social growth to be more comfortable at being good at math as a, as a girl, as you just said, um, makes up for it. And you would see maybe a 60 40 or a, you know, 65 35 split if you were looking at sixth graders versus third graders. Do you follow Right, what yeah. I think if you look at seventh and eighth grade, they see the numbers start balancing out. Right. So it's really skewed, and then you get to six, seven, and then all of a sudden you so get to high school and face the other direction a little bit. So it, it does, the gap does narrow in seven and eight. So it does happen on its own. You know, with but, to, but to the point, I think that, at least I'm hearing here, is because of that, those students may be getting cut out on the early end in the, in the new. Right, right, absolutely. So that's, which is what I was trying to get at is, you know, finding out why that's actually happening, right? So if we have a girl who's in, in third grade who belongs in an accelerated mathematics program, how do you find that girl, right? If 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 that particular if it is social emotional, that girl's not going to go into um, a series of mathematics assessments, trying to do well, right, and kind of just holding back a little bit, and falls just below that cutoff. You know, how do we find that person? So does the Rensselaer, the, the teacher piece, which is forty percent, does that grab them? Um, does the Kogak grab them? Because it's not it, it's not um, overtly mathematic. It's patterns and shapes and. So the pieces of that that they might um, not see as uh, this is a diagnostic math test. So I'm hopeful that what we see is at the very least in June, we have in second grade more balance. I mean, I don't know that it's going to be perfectly balanced, but my hope is that in designing that, that we're going to see more balance between male and female. Um, if, if you're computing each in June and that wasn't the case, um, you know, we're going to talk about some of the solutions. In the meantime, we sort of look at the legacy program, right? What do we do going forward, and how do we make sure that we don't have a girl in fourth grade or fifth grade um, who didn't make that initial cut who now is kind of stuck outside the program for a little bit? Um, and it might be something as simply going back through talking to staff and looking at the rental we scales uh, on a one to one basis with students who might have been um, on the edge where a teacher said, I really was surprised, um, and then using the scales as a second tool. Can I just share something that's just No tutoring, no specials in line, none of that. And the 
girl said, I don't want to do it. I have no mm -hmm. better. So she went through, finished everything. Now she's in high school. So the thing is that I believe, at least what I got out of that conversation and that one observation, the girl has to see the benefit of wanting to do it. And I, and I it's not, even to me, it wasn't even social and emotional. It's like, well, what's in it for me? And I think that's what the girl didn't see at that point. So it is, she goes, it's more work. I have to go in early. I don't want to do the extra work. So it is, I, I'm not always sure that it's so clear cut what the answers really are. Well, it sounds like we're going to be monitoring it. Yeah, yeah. And, um, that's great. We'll get an update when you get the new um, <laughs> diagnostics done. Yeah. So I'm sorry to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I have a couple questions. <laughs> If you hear something you don't like, charge. <laughs> Go sit down. Uh, sit down and then we'll see. The, uh, I, I had a ton of questions because I had trouble reading this. You did a good job in presenting it, so uh, that helped me. But item one, systematic monitoring of the curriculum, or the standards of the curriculum. You, you didn't give an example. What's an example of a, it, 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 are you talking about the sins of my way or something? No. Well, what More about? like what I described that uh, Mr. Hunter looked into. Yeah, well, what was that? That was the grades, the um, language arts grades. They revised the classes in grades six to eight. They revised the course quite extensively. And we were monitoring like how the students were doing. So that was a question that had come up. So that's that's an example. Okay, well then I'm going to move on a little bit. Okay, okay. that helped me. Um, I, I want to talk a little bit about uh, uh, the testing, and I think it's, uh, uh, I don't want to give part too much credit yet, because I, I think it is early, and, and I hope when we start evaluating the results that it doesn't become political, and we have to protect the governor and his uh, Department of Education, with all the greatest thing in the world, we just have to get it, because I think, uh, Honesty is going to be important in evaluating this, and I'm going to challenge probably the honesty part. There's people with jobs and careers and a whole lot of stuff. I have my questions about it, part of the common pool. So honesty would, would be enough, you know, I, I hope. Um, gifted and talented. Uh, I want to, uh, and I'm not, I'm not going to touch male and female. I don't have any idea what those results should be, or, so who knows. What I would hate to say is if there is a difference, oh, we're going to make it the same. And society has a way of doing a lot of that today. And I, I, I don't have any facts and I don't want to enter that. But I do want to enter the fact that the gifted and talented after second grade, I think I'm right, that the age group would be from 84 months up to 96 months of the students in uh, second grade. Maybe I'm out a little bit, but I, I, I try to estimate the age, the ones who are the youngest and the ones that are the oldest. That's a tremendous age gap, a tremendous knowledge gap. So we start doing it in second grade, it's like uh, uh, Uncle Gladwell with outliers. You know, the hockey team, everybody was born January, February, March, probably nobody else in the Canadian hockey league. And uh, we're doing this a little bit in second grade. I think it has to be done, or should be done, never mind, has to be, should be done every year. And, and, and you can't evaluate uh, geniuses and stuff. I, I think Einstein was a special ed student, if I'm not mistaken. So I, I think it's a mistake to do it once in second grade and then go forward and, and not give the kids a chance every year to get into And the ones that aren't that smart, that have tutoring or parents that really push them or whatever, I think they should be retested. So I, I, I don't have a, a major problem with gifted and talented, but it, it should be objective. It, it may not be, I think, if you do it at the end of second grade. Uh, and, and the fact that seniors continue to, to grow, and, and hard work is part of this too. So if someone's going to put the effort in, if they want to stretch um, and, and, and put the extra effort, they might be able to catch the other gifted and talented student who's a little lazy. So, uh, 
engineering and med school. Uh, engineering, you have to solve problems. Med school, you have to memorize like crazy. It's, it's a totally different mentality. It's not even close. Uh, intelligence, but different kinds. Common Core, I'm getting calls from grandchildren's parents. How do you do these problems? And I have trouble reading the, the English problems because they are word problems, but some of them are very, very complicated to understand what they're even asking for. The math part is the easy part. It's what are they asking? So I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to wait for the uh, time a little bit and uh, evaluate Common Core later. I, I think there's a lot of problems with the whole program. Rushed and not tested, and, um, and, and some of the problems I can't do. Well, I can, but uh, uh, the whole family gets different answers because it's not algebra. It's they can't speak English and they're with the problems. That's my two cents. Thank you, Mike. Does anyone else have any questions for Linda? So we're moving on to advocacy. Did you meet since you had our last board meeting? I'm going to start to lose track. <laughs> no, we, we haven't met since then, but we've been before. Okay, so um, advocacy met on, the, on March 2nd, and um, we talked about the district-wide pre um, presentations that um, supervisors and um, curriculum are doing across for all the PTOs. Last, um, on March 16th, Dr. Um, Mr. Hunter had, um, had one at the Ridge Path, um, and was creating successful writers and how the district's teaches writing. Um, our next district-wide um, presentation is on April 30th at 9 a.m. at Liberty Corner School. Dr. Heineman is going to give a presentation about um, technology and all the board members are able to attend and as well as the public. Um, before um, the advocacy committee, we, um, this committee used to be called Community Relations. And we discussed how building and maintaining relationships was an incredibly important part of this community. And how we just talked about how um, different board members have been reaching out to other members of the community to talk about um, important issues that have come up or things that are important to other people and how we want to continue to do that. Um, someone brought up the idea of having more forum type meetings where there would be an exchange dialogue back and forth to discuss important issues in the community as it relates to our district's public schools. The committee, um, the committee um, informed that person that it was part of our board priorities discussion for after their meeting, and um, that we were going to talk about the details of logistics and doing that, and I'll put that later on in here as well. Um, remember, this is from March 2nd um, minute. So um, we talked about Bill A4190, a delaying the results of PARC, which would delay the impact of the new state standardized test for two years, including student placement and teacher evaluation, and this bill was passed in the um, NJ Assembly on February 23rd. Bill A3079, um, protecting students in K through twos, um, states, stated a, a school district may not administer commercially developed standardized tests to students through second grade, and as a, of our, the advocacy committee on March 2nd, this bill did not be voted on the assembly. However, um, on March 9th, this bill, along with Bill 30177, which requires districts to inform parents about standardized testing, was being passed in the assembly. And last but not least, Bill 84165, the option to opt out. This bill, um, if approved, would allow families the option to not participate in the administration of the assessment require the district to provide edu educationally appropriate alternative, alternate activities in a room other than where the assessments are being administered during testing. This particular bill had passed only the Assembly Education Committee and had not come up with the full assembly at that time. Um, Mr. McCarrion talked about um, our state aid being flat. Um, to, and said that our, our expected anticipated budget was going to be three, 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 uh, three million one hundred seventeen thousand six hundred forty-two. So, 
I just wonder why. Um, and then, just see, I can't remember. Um, oh, when you were talking about what David Hunter said, oh, he actually did a really nice um, writing presentation, which I went to with you. Um, you. You spoke about uh, a cold breed and how that impacted someone's semester grade, or I guess a lot of children's semesters grade. And I guess the part that bothered me about it is once the teachers realized that the material probably wasn't taught sufficiently, that's great. But I say take the grade out of the rule book. I mean, obviously it didn't impact my kids, but I just feel like that's fair. If you acknowledge that, oh my god, the kids didn't get this, it should not impact their semester grade. It should come out, the teacher should reteach it, and then retest. So I don't know if you talked about that, but that seems really Forum. Um, we have one topic listed on, on here. Um, I actually forgot to find it now. I stole some of Linda's curriculum minutes, which you guys have already gotten. Well, I have it here. Um, I, I plagiarized from Linda's minutes, um, and then we had a meeting on it. So you should have already read some of what I'm going to say, but I'm going to say it all because the public needs to hear it. Do it. But, um, <laughs> I plagiarized her minutes and then I added some more detail based on the meeting that, um, that we went to um, in another meeting at Ridge on Thursday afternoon that Beth and I attended of the committee that's looking at the schedule. So I added some of the new information mixed in with Linda's minutes. So I'm going to pass this out since I didn't email it to you guys and then I'll um, kind of go through it with, um, with the public um, just to get everyone up to speed. Um, I know Beth and I have promised that we would give um, regular updates to the Board of Ed about um, everything that's being discussed on the committee. And I know a lot of board members have been very interested in hearing what discussions have been going on. Um, so the committee that, that um, Frank, Mr. Howlett, is leading at the high school has a number of people on it. Um, Dr. Heineman, the director of the curriculum, is on it. Um, the director of guidance, supervisor of guidance, Jillian Shavis, is on it because she has obviously a big um, input into the scheduling process. Um, assistant principal, Gina Dunleavy, is on there. She also does a lot with the scheduling. Um, Beth Swartner and I are the Board of Ed members on the committee. There are two parents. They happen to be the Ridge co-presidents co of PTL. Two students that are seniors, um, which was very interesting on the site visits because they got to talk to all the kids and get a lot of good information. Um, and they gave a survey to all the students to fill out, which was good. Um, and there are four teachers from departments that we anticipate could have some complications with a different type of schedule. Um, so that's the Fine Arts and Music Department, the PE Department, the Science Department, and Special Education. Um, the other areas, it, it wouldn't really change because they don't have labs and different things. So they're going to be um, included in the process, but they weren't on the site visits. Um, so we met briefly for introductions, and then we went on two site visits of schools that have a rotating drop schedule. Um, when Mr. Hallett started looking into alternate schedules, there's other types out there. There's regular block schedule. There's block schedules where you do half a year and then half a year, which we didn't want to look at for various reasons. So the one that he thought looked the most promising and that a lot of schools have been switching to, a lot of schools that we talk to and compare ourselves to, is this rotating drop schedule. Um, it looks a little different at different schools. The two that we looked at are Washington Hills, Regional and Livingston. Um, Chatham also has the schedule, and people on the committee have talked to people in Chatham about it too. Um, so we went on these two site visits. It was very interesting. We got to see the kids, we got to see how lunch worked, we got to talk to the teachers and hear from different people in the building about how it works. Um, people got to meet up with their counterparts, so the science teachers, not science teachers. You know, the, um, I guess um, principals talked to the other principals. Um, Mrs. Retzko was there to represent the music department, so she met with the band and choir and orchestra teachers. Um, so basically the gist of these rotating schedules, which I brought um, a print out, they were attached, well there was a link in um, Linda's minutes to these, but I'll pass them out if anyone didn't um, have a chance to look at it or wants to, but they're on the websites of these schools. You can go right on Washington Post or Livingston and see them. 
Um, one from Livingston shows the year-long schedule about how they you rotate through um, the A, B, C, and D day all year long. So it has all the different months. And then the Washington Hills one shows in more detail the day and what it looks like. Um, so the two schools do it a little bit different, sorry. The two schools do it a little bit differently as far as um, the order that they um, drop a period and whether the periods always stay in the same order every day. So um, at one of the schools, they switch around more, I guess, at Livingston. <coughs> so one of the benefits to switching the order is that you don't always have the same subject first period when you're asleep or ninth period when you can't concentrate. So that was one of the benefits that the students talked a lot about it. Um, at the school. So the, the blocks would be, I mean, the periods would be longer than our 40, 41 or 42 or 43 minutes. Yeah, so they, they're about an hour, depending on the, on the school and how you do it. Um, so there's less times that you switch classes each day because you don't have every class each day. So that would increase instructional time because you wouldn't have as many passing time. You know, you don't have as many switches because you lose minutes every time you switch. Um, so you it would have four different days. So each day you would have two classes that you don't have. And how they do it is different in each school, and that, that, that's something that would, um, can be done a lot of different ways. Um, the lunch, everyone eats at the same time, and so that was interesting to see. It was a lot of kids. It was, it was like, they said it was controlled chaos, and it was, because it was, I never saw any, I never saw anything out of control or over the top, in me. even the noise level was reasonable, but there was a ton of kids, and they're all eating lunch at the same time, all over the building. Um, so it was really interesting. They, when they did the setup and takedown, they were like so fast. Every single person ran out and put tables away really fast, and it was amazing how quickly they could turn a gym back into a gym. Like it was full of tables of kids eating, and then like three minutes later, it was a gym again. So um, on the site visits, we got to you know observe all of this and ask lots of questions. Um, so we, we reconvened, I guess, to, to discuss how it went and um, some of the issues that you know, people had concerns about before we even went out to look. Um, one of the concerns is about how it would affect the um, music department at Ridge because we have a very robust program. Neither of the schools we looked at has um, the numbers that we do in the programs. And like one school didn't have a band during the day. They only had an orchestra and a choir, and then they had marching band after school. And then the other school, I think, was missing the other, whether it's missing the orchestra. So neither of the schools had as a robust of a program. Um, and so um, we asked a lot of questions about how they did the, did the um, things like sectionals and things like that. Um, and Mrs. Resco found some ideas that she thinks might work. She did a preliminary survey of her choir students to see how many kids could be impacted by the fact that maybe they're doing something flexible with their lunch period in order to take choir. And so the band and orchestra teachers are going to have to survey the students and work with guidance because a lot of these students, it doesn't even show up in their schedule. And so they have to figure out how many kids that it could affect and how it would affect them and what different solutions. But they have some ideas. Um, science was another um, one that people were concerned about in terms of labs and how that would work. Um, the schools did it very differently. At Watching the Hills, um, some classes, I think, CP um, science and some of the honor sciences had no lab. Um, some of the honors classes had a half of a lunch lab every week, and then the AP science had a full lunch period every week, you know, combined with their, either right before or after their science class. At Livingston, um, all science labs were scheduled during half of the lunch, and everyone had a lab, but nobody had a whole lab. So the AP had the same lab as the CP. So it was very different at each school, and clearly there's lots of flexibility with how much of lunches or how many lunches labs, and there's also other ways to handle the labs. Um, so that's something that the science department is discussing, um, but is very, they're very aware, obviously, of that issue. Um, let's see. I talked a lot about the science in there. One one thing that um, that Mr. Hall talked about at the curriculum meeting that was in Linda's minutes is that we're going to be adopting the next generation science standards, and they involve a lot more hands-on and STEM type stuff, and so. While we're rewriting the curriculum, we have to um, find ways to fit that all in, which is really difficult with the shorter periods that we have at Ridge. So it actually, you know, this type of schedule is much better for these new science standards. And so I guess the timing is good that if, if we were going to go with this, which we don't know that we are yet, um, at least the timing works out for rewriting the curriculum for science. Um, let's see. Um, oh, at both schools, we heard a lot about how the teacher duties are assigned and how that would be affected. It actually sounds like there's a lot of um, 
possibilities for flexibility on how duties are assigned. There's not as, since there's only one lunch, you don't have to have as many lunch duties or tutorial duties, so that might be a bit easier, but then there's other issues that you have to cover. Um, but teachers ask questions about how PLCs, professional learning communities, will work because we've just got that really going at rich, and, and it sounds like there's ways to make that work, work with this type of schedule also, according to the teachers at those schools. Um, so really, when we reconvened on Thursday, but you can chime in after I talk, but the main point was we, we want to increase instructional time and see what other benefits that we can get out of this, like reducing stress um, on the students and teachers and making our time more efficient. So the committee decided that at this point, um, Mr. Howlett's going to make a like, more formal presentation to the committee, compiling all the different information he's gathered in, all at one time. And the committee members and Mr. Howlett from the different departments are going to go to those departments and present it to them so that they can see what the issues are and how it looks. And then they're going to talk about it in their departments and give feedback back to the committee about other issues that we may not have anticipated, problems, concerns, questions. And then at that point, if the committee still thinks it sounds viable and is still interested, at that point it would get presented to the board. Because at this point, it's still fairly preliminary and um, they want to make sure that they address all the different issues. Does that make sense though? <laughs> yeah, I, I think you gave a really good overview. I mean, I think the key takeaway though is this is just something we're looking into, and if it's something that we ultimately decide is viable, it's going to take several years to deploy this new type of scheduling. So this is not something that's imminent. Um, the thing that stood out for me is in speaking with the administrators, the faculty, and the students in the schools that we toured, unanimously they all prefer this type of scheduling. Um, I even specifically asked what schools in New Jersey have adopted this type of schedule and then decided to go back to the old method because I wanted to speak to some people at one of those schools. They don't exist. Every school that has adopted this schedule has kept with it and preferred it. And there was actually data that supported these opinions. Um, some of the things that the, the students told me that they really liked um, was less stress from homework relief, because on any given day, they only have to prepare for six of their classes, not eight. Um, they love the fact that they get to have lunch with all their friends, because everyone has lunch at the same time. And in addition to that, because everyone has lunch at the same time, <coughs> the availability to get tutoring or to meet as a club can happen at lunchtime, so clubs aren't all meeting before school or after school. Um, the, the faculty really appreciated the longer classes. There was more traction in instruction and learning because of the longer classes. And the other big benefit that everyone kept talking about is if you're not a morning person, your first period class is only your first period class one out of every four days. If you're miserable right before lunch, your class right before lunch is only your class right before lunch one out of every four days because of the rotation. Um, Conversely, though, I know that Robin mentioned there were some concerns about putting the sectional groups in for all of our music programs. That would be hard. How we fit the science labs in. Um, another negative cited by some of the, the math faculty members were, particularly for lower performing students, there was an advantage to meeting daily in a math class. And obviously with this, that wouldn't be happening. Um, also, figuring out a way to do the schedule so everyone meets their minimum PE requirements. We think we could do it, but we have to look into it. So that was um, that's why it's so critical that it goes back to departmental review. Um, the, the other one negative that the students said, overwhelmingly they preferred this schedule, but students did tell me every fourth day sometimes they have a really hard day just the way the classes fall sometimes. There are some students who have all their hardest key academic areas falling on the same day. And so it makes for their hard day. But conversely, the, the same student told me, but yeah, I just get ready for cycle B, get over it, and then I have three more days to Yeah, it's kind of, it's kind of like college. So, and the teachers said the same thing. They have like their, good, their worst day, yeah. and then their two medium days, and then their really good, good day. That's right. easier. Yeah. Um, you know, so from, from the, the committee's representation, you know, the, the administrators are particularly working on how it fits into scheduling and how we'd be able to schedule it. Um, we might even need to deploy a new scheduling system to get it to work. 
And then departmentally, I think it's going to be really important when it goes back to the faculty in each of the departments, because they're going to think of things that we didn't think of or that the students didn't think of. The, the students on the committee, I think, were the, the most positive about it. They, they were really in the trenches talking with the other kids, and they liked it a lot. So, any questions? I know both of them are in chorus. I don't know for sure. Oh yeah, and one, of, one of them's definitely a band in chorus. Yes. I think they might both be. Yeah, the, the other thing is you have to keep in mind, it, it's going to be a new baseline because at Livingston, the, the system has been deployed so long that I believe it's only the senior class who's there now who can remember the old scheduling model. Um, and it's just what they're used to. I think the, the students that will be the most challenges are the students in transition. So when we deploy it, it's the kids who had the old schedule and the new schedule and they'll be comparing. But even the students we took, spoke with who were part of the old and the new were resisting the first but preferred the new model once it was deployed. I, um, you know, I think, I think it's really important to, if what this might might be a wonderful program but we have a really high performing school that does really well and I hate to do something that's going to change that I mean I don't know how much more academically rigorous we want to get to be honest and I think we're pretty rigorous right now we do really well on standardized tests we do really well on AP exams um, in the sciences already so I hate to see um, and I, I know I know just from my own experience my daughter does both um, chorus and orchestra and she wouldn't be able to do that given the rigor of her schedule, she'd have to probably give up both or not um, one of them. And I, I think the arts is such an important thing for students to have as a, you know, as a, as a respite during the day, especially if you have a, you have a challenging schedule, it's, it gives you a chance to sort of think of something else, you know, do something else, use a different part of your brain. Um, we have such wonderful programs. I'm sure many of you have been to our um, concerts over the last few years, but they're amazing. The orchestra is amazing, the band's amazing, the chorus is phenomenal. I just would hate to see anything happen to um, weaken those programs because I think they're a really special thing and I think they make the kids happy. I think, you know, it's something important that maybe you're not going to be professional in any of those fields, but it's something that really, um, you know, broadens your interests and um, makes you a whole person. So I wouldn't want to lose any of that. I, mean, I share those concerns and my kids are in both choir and, um, and orchestra. Um, some of the concerns I had were alleviated by hearing different done to work it out, but not all of my concerns have been alleviated. I think we need to get more information um, about that, because that is one of my biggest concerns about it. There are some ways to, to help and make it work with their schedules, you know, um, right, right. that at first glance it looks like they wouldn't be able to do it, but they can. Um, so that's definitely an issue that, um, that needs to get looked at further. Mike? Uh, I have a question. Uh, seven period day, eight period day. Uh, what are these schools on? They have the same number of classes as us. You have eight academic classes and a lunch. And, and the way it, it works in both the schools, although they call it different things, is for example, you have class one through four being in the morning, but on day one it's one, one, two, three, and you don't have four. Then on day it's two, three, four, and you don't have one, and then it's three, four, or one. And, and, they, and they do the same thing in the afternoon. So they still have eight academic, or eight classes, it's just on any given day, six of them are meeting, but for longer periods of time. I am certainly for longer classes. You get the time back in transition, because there are fewer transitions in every any given day. I still like, and it's a disappointment to be very dead, so we'll, we'll come back to that point later. Uh, stress. My gosh, the kids at, at age six are on a traveling team. Parents are out almost every day of the week. Uh, you know, traveling teams are going all over the place. 20 mile radius is nothing at all. You know, stress, so well, it's fun. My gosh, you struck out, you missed the tackle, or you missed the shot. Stress is, uh, but not academic stress. And, and as good as this district is, and I think it is a wonderful district, we're not Milburn, we're not Princeton. We're not close to that yet. So, comment that, uh, uh, and I don't know what those schools, I don't know whether Milburn, a couple of the schools have the, uh, the short pay, but uh, I'm not sure if Milburn have it, but uh, I'm an advocate of uh, more time on tennis and, and, and some pressure. Well, 
this definitely would be more time on task. Um, the, as far as the achievement, we did ask in Livingston specifically. I remember sitting there when they asked um, somebody asked the um, principal about what, what about their test scores and whether they've seen a change in their test scores after they switched to this. And he said that the test scores are up a little bit after, in the last few years since they've switched to this, but it's hard to prove a correlation because there could be other explanations for that. But they certainly didn't go down; they went up. But you can't prove that it's from this. But at least it was good news that they were up <laughs> as opposed to flat or down. Um, and in terms of stress, I, all, like all of the students and a lot of the teachers said that they found that this was less stressful. They thought it would be stressful keeping track because it would be confusing, but they said they found it less, less stressful. Yeah, I think the, the ramp up was stressful, for, particularly for teachers who've worked out their lesson plans over the years where they have, you know, you can't just take five days of 45 minute periods and switch them to four days of hour. You have to manipulate. Um, and there was definitely a lot of resistance in a few of the departments, particularly at Livingston, they came and spoke with us about it. Um, but even though there was resistance at first, once the schedule came into play and they got used to it, the teachers overwhelmingly preferred it. But you know, like any change, it's, it's hard at first. It's ultimately the result that you're looking for. Mm -hmm. They, some schools call it the all fall down lunch. Lunch isn't just in the cafeteria. Um, I know. And it's handled different ways. I see it appears as if he's already had the discussion with the high school administration regarding this. It's not just something that came up around here. And um, I just think we, since we decide the money, we may need to keep in mind that we may need to update the cafeteria because of the in the models we saw, and, and keep in mind, we don't know if we're going to do this and we don't know what model we're going to approach. It was handled two different ways. At Watch on Hills, they had physical space for the majority of students. They actually had spaces identified for the freshmen to have lunch. The sophomores went to another place to have lunch. They had, I think, an old gym, an old auto body shop room that wasn't being used. So they had physical space for the different classes. It's handled differently in Livingston, where it's more of an all fall down lunch, where the students are everywhere having their lunch. In warmer weather, there are outdoor areas. There are kiosks set up from the food services company throughout the building where the students can get their food. Um, so there are students in nooks and crannies everywhere, where, wherever they went. And also, the seniors have the privilege of leaving campus during the lunch period. And of course, we might need to operate, or we might think of a model that works with our keep existing facilities. Yeah, definitely. Just keep it in mind, the kitchens are not really up to date. They're what we have now. So, one question and one comment. Um, I, this came up at the community, I think. I have concerns about closing the <coughs> lunch because of the, the topic that you guys have been talking about regarding um, the arts or, or the science labs. I would hate to think that a student can't attend a club because they have to go to science lab. That should never happen, in my opinion. And then my question is, um, just looking at the Watch and Hills schedule, either that or Robin, um, is it a continuous one, two, three, four, even if there's a holiday, a half day? So I'm just wondering, is there a situation you can fall into where you're missing because vacations or boy breaks fall, but you're missing a particular class too much? Yeah, it, we, we actually asked that question, and because of planning and the, the teachers planning their lessons, they decided that the best way to do it was to have a designated schedule on the calendar, 
and it goes, you know, day one, day two, day three, day four, day eight, B, C, D, and then it repeats and they stick to it. And then when there is a snow day, you've just lost that day. Um, I believe it was, was it in Livingston where they even built a couple of extra makeup days at the end where they would throw in, say, an A day or a C day, depending on when the snow days fell. But what the feedback the teachers gave is they wanted all the classes they were teaching pretty much on the same cycle. So it didn't pay to have a day at the end of the marking period to catch up because they had already caught up. So they were sticking with a pre-designated calendar. Yeah, I think Washington Hills said, I think it was Washington Hills said that the first year they did try to have a contingency plan if there was a day missed and it didn't work. And then after that they just scrapped it and they had a preset schedule for the year um, and it just works its way out. And I guess, you know, theoretically, you could get unlucky and all your snow days are on Mondays like this year. Yeah. <laughs> and then the teachers... Except you, you've got, that's the old model. It's not, mon it's not a five week cycle of Monday day. through Friday. Yeah, it's all a your four snow days could be on an A day. And then, yeah. And so they said it kind of evens out generally, but they did they did try other things and it, they decided it's easier to just have it preset because then everyone knew what was going to happen. So in that, I'm thinking of tests. So if you miss a test, it's just the next part of the next time the class you don't have to wait until like a cycle of days. Um, or make it up at lunch or whatever. You know what I mean? You could do it the same thing you do now. Well, but maybe make the whole class. class or oh, you mean the whole class? Yeah. 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 I mean, you only miss each class once every four days. The, the other thing that brought up an interesting thing is when I first looked at these, I was so confused and I said, how do you guys do it? Don't the students get lost and confused? And what they said was, the kids pick it up really quickly. It was the, the <laughs> teachers and the administrators That's who had trouble yeah. keeping up with it. Right. Um, this green paper that you all have, these are hanging all over the walls of Livingston High School. So when the students come in, if they don't remember if it's an A day, a B day, a C day, or a D day, these are hanging everywhere to remind them. In fact, I'll pass one out. To Basically, that's what's going on. Well, we'll be very interested to hear what the different departments at Rich have to say about it. So I'm sure there's be some issues, and some of which probably haven't been discussed yet. So, Mike? Uh, I have uh, two quick items, I think. A uh, random drug testing letter went out uh, to the public, and uh, we believe this is a great program. I'm quoting the letter. Uh, we believe this is a great uh, opportunity for parents to help deter a child's use of drugs. We strongly encourage parents to select and enroll. And then the second page, which I think is a, a wonderful addition, is uh, of course parents can choose to randomly drug test children on their on their own outside of the school program. Now they can buy the test kits. It's a very very serious problem, and, and uh, I think the parents owe it to the children to find out whether they're involved with drugs. And the only way I I've ever heard that you can determine it is not by how the kid acts because they're strange in high school anyway. <laughs> it's what's the what's the urine test going to show? So that was my one comment. Second item, uh, you know I missed last week's uh, board meeting because I went to the basketball game in high school, and I tried to say this in closed session. They wouldn't let me talk. Uh, but when the two teams came out, the basketball teams, uh, the rich fans, the kids. Food, the, uh, the living team. So that was the first comment I had. The Star Spangled Banner, there were a couple kids talking about the Star Spangled Banner. And the, the kids in the, in the group, and about a third, I mean, that's probably too wide, a fifth of the uh, people at, at the event were students, and they were all together. And they're going, shh, shh, trying to make these uh, couple kids keep quiet, and they failed. And they finally joined in and they finished the Star Spangled Banner as a group. They couldn't, uh, they couldn't keep the kids from hacking around. Uh, every time they didn't like a referee call, and this is what I tried to say in closed sessions, so I would say it, but very loud chants and they were cursing. There's little kids in the gym. Uh, I think, uh, I didn't see, I, I saw uh, the athletic director, but I didn't see any of the uh, principals or anything. I, I think the kids need a little bit of training. I thought they were, uh, uh, I won't say a disgrace, but they were very poor guys. Uh, I also went to uh, 
Barbara Bretzko's uh, session on Tuesday night. What a great session. About 20 songs from Catherine. Yeah, okay. But I had two high school girls in front of us who couldn't sit in their seats and they had their, their you know, iPhones on and iPads and they were jumping around and passing it back and forth. Uh, I think a little bit of supervision there too. They said no, but uh, you know, they were hacking around. So those are my two. Uh, and uh, just to finish the week, on Thursday I went to a Liberty Corner uh, uh, play in high school, and that was very good. And I didn't see any iPhones. But <laughs> Turn. So I'm going to take a motion. Bev, you always know it first. <laughs> so I'm like second, John. 